Welcome to worship at Union Presbyterian Church online, of course. Glad everyone's staying home and staying safe. Um, we'd love to hear from you. So if you could, if you're new to the church, uh, if you could click on our connection card on our webpage, that'd be great. Um, you can request to be added to our weekly email. Uh, you can update your own con contact information. You can make a comment or ask a question. Um, all sorts of good stuff starts with that. So if you're new to our church, please go through that portal and let us know who you are and how we can serve you. We do have face masks physically here, so if you are local to Los Altos, we would love to get you a face mask provided to us by the city of Los Altos. So if we have sizes for children as well, so if that's you, let us know. We do have sermon notes that are online, um, so you can follow along and take notes as you listen. They include the scripture passages and sermon highlights. That's also found on a button on our, on our home site, which is unionpc.org. They're also found in our weekly email. For our kids, the, the, you know, this has been rough on the kids, being isolated and at home, so we have some things that, that we have put up online, Bible studies, activities, you go to our website and hit the Kids Place Online button, and then we have, through Zoom, our, our children's time at 12.30 um, in Sunday afternoon. So if you want to get involved with that, let us know. Send a message to children underscore youth at unionpc.org, and we'll get you all the information. If you'd like to support our ministry to get our efforts uh, to get God's word of hope, love, and reconciliation out to the local community and to the world, you can visit upc.org slash give if you prefer to send a check. Our, web, our address is on the website as well. We do continue through this time to give 22% of what we get in goes out to our missionaries of the general giving. The Deacon's Fund, um, I should say the Deacon's Fund. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's a Communion Sunday. This fund was designed so our deacons could be able to help the people that we know financially with rent and gas and food and medication and, and et cetera. So with your support, we can continue to do that. Um, you can use the same giving methods as before, but note Deacon's Fund in the memo line. Remember, today is the first Sunday in August, so we're going to celebrate communion, and I'd ask that you have your communion elements ready. Uh, any bread or cracker is fine, and any grape-based drink is good, too. You know, the live stream worship continues. We are uh, looking forward to a time where we can worship together in person. Um, it, this is just trying times. But we are trying to follow as, hard as, as, as closely as possible the guidelines through Santa Clara County um, to ensure everyone's protection. So stay at home, worship with us online. If you have missed a service in the past or thought one was good and wanted to share it, you can certainly do that. It's at livestream.com slash UPC Los Altos. 
Um, starting today, actually, we're going to have a union coffee hour. So after, the ten, after this service, um, you can grab a cup of coffee and tea and join us on Zoom or for our Zoom coffee hour. Zoom details are going to be available in the link on our live stream page and our website, and they're also included in our weekly email. So if you want to see people and connect, go there. Just say hi. It should, should be a nice time. And then lastly, Operation Christmas Child. This, this year we're going to be participating in that again um, because of everything that's going on. We're asking for more monetary donations than, than personal things. Um, so if you want to give you can to that specifically, you can go to the same portal, the same giving um, way to give through online, and then put uh, um, Operation Christmas Child in the memo line. All right, we're still collecting empty shoeboxes, and those can be dropped off at the church office. More details of this project are posted online, um, and it will be in our weekly email updates. So our memory verse for, uh, for August is, is this. It's from James 5, 8 and 9. If you read it with me. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord coming near... Don't, Don't grumble against, against one another, brothers, brothers or sisters, sisters, or you, you will be judged. judged. The judge, judge is standing at the door. Uh, again, thank you for joining us to worship. May you be blessed and draw closer to God. And I'll turn it over to Jamie for the call to worship. All right, I invite you to join us in the call to worship this morning, which comes from Psalm 72, verses 11 through 15. May all kings bow down to God and all nations serve God. For he will deliver the needy who cry out of the affliction and who have no helper. He will take pity on the poor and needy and save the lives of the oppressed. He will redeem them from oppression and violence, for their blood is precious in his sight. And together, may pe people ever may they bless him all day long. And this morning we have some guests with us that are going to help us to bless the Lord together. And we have Ran um, Cindy Dinga and later Randy uh, will join us, Randy Dinga. And we have Andrew Halligan and my husband Daniel Wolfinger on bass. So um, we're going to praise the Lord together. And we're going to start with a song called The Lion and the Lamb. And every knee 
together.
bride. Let's head into a time of prayer together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be in your presence, even though we're part, of course, um, that we are together, united in you. And as we come together, we are reminded that none of us are the people that we want to be, much less the person that you designed us to be. Uh, that, that we have been entangled in sin. We have let things take root in our heart and, and they shape us and they mold us um, into their image rather than yours. And so this is our time, Lord, with you to, to just admit our failings, our shortcomings, our sin, our, 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 the evil that lives within us so that you can root it out so that you can replace it with your word, so you can replace it with yourself, with the Holy Spirit, and that you can be building in our hearts your house. So, Lord, I ask that you would lead us this morning as we confess our sins. Lord, hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, you know us so well. There's nobody in the world that knows us better than you. You know what we're good at and you know what we aren't. And you love us still and you've given us this this blessing to be able to just come and say what we've done, how we know we are. Um, so, Lord, for, for the things that we have lifted up, for our failings, for our anger, for our bitterness, for our frustration, for our, our inability to, to be patient with, with certain people, Lord, we apologize and ask for your grace to continue to change us and mold us more and more into your image. We want the things that we think about and the things that we say and the things that we do to reflect your love and grace to the world around us. Evidence that we have been loved and graced with your presence. So Lord, we thank you for this opportunity just to come and say it out and receive forgiveness again. Thank you for the cross. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The good news of the gospel is that we are graced, we are forgiven, that God is good, that God still loves us, that he went to the cross and died for us, that we, the consequences of our sin are no longer ours, but he has taken that from us. So I can say with the full assurance of God's word that you are graced, you are forgiven, God loves you, and that is good. Amen? Amen. Okay. So normally we have an Old Testament reading, but this morning we have a, um, a reading from the New Testament reading, when I can find it. Ah, good. So here it is. And it's because this reading is, is so long. It's a long passage. You know it, um, but I wanted to get all of it in. So this is from Matthew 13, I'm going to start with 1 to 9, and then 18 to 30. It says this, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then I'm jumping down to 18, uh, 13, 18. 
Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. Anyone who hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among <clears throat> the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on the good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds, uh, weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? An enemy did this, he said. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. So we're looking at a couple parables today. Uh, obviously, the parable of the soils and the seed, uh, but also then the wheat and the chaff. Um, so... It's a, I'm going to combine those two into one sermon, so bear with me. And then I'm going to start right now and read 36 through the end of the chapter, um, uh, the explanation uh, of, the, of the last parable. And, uh, and then we'll get into the, the whole sermon. So this is it, starting in verse 36. Then he, Jesus, left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The seed, the, rather, the field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the in enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. The son of man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his, of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will be thrown into the fiery furnace, furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for the cross. And I ask your blessing on, on this time, Lord, our time with you in your word to think about it and let, to let it reexamine our lives to see how we are shaping up. Lord, be with us this morning. This is your time. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when I lived in New York, I, I encountered something which I understand to be an issue in many areas of Christianity, but, but often in our country. There were people who came to my church every week, very faithfully, not because they believed in the Bible, not because they loved Jesus. They came because that was what they were expected to do. It was Sunday, and on Sunday, everybody went to church. That's how it is. I think they thought everybody was miserable, too, but everybody went to church. Um, yeah, it was, I think this is in more stable communities, if I'm honest, where people can go and see their parents and their grandparents who have been in this town, in this area, for a long time. These are very stable communities, and these are people who are just expected by their community, by their families, that they will go to church on Sunday, but they don't have the, really the passion to be there. My, my friend said it was really worse for him down in Virginia when, when in his first call. Everybody, he said, in that whole town, everybody went to church. Everybody had their own pew, even, even the drug dealers, e even... Even the people who had been out drinking and drugging the night before, everybody was in church. Now, the rest of the week, they weren't interested in Jesus or the Bible or even living in a way that reflected God's glory and grace to the world. But Sunday morning, they were in the pews. 
checking their watches every five minutes to see if time had stopped. One of the nice things about California is that because it's more of a transitional area, almost everybody my age or older is from somewhere else. And so there isn't the stability of community. There aren't the people that have watched you grow up and who expect you to be in church on Sunday. And so consequently, there isn't the social stigma attached to not going to church. And as far as I can tell, that has been true during my lifetime in California. I mean, California is a place where you can come and reinvent yourself, where you don't have to go to church anymore if you don't want to. And so consequently, the people who actually are in church on a given Sunday are pretty committed to, to, to God. And so perhaps this, te this text is a better, uh, um, better for my previous church and a previous area because it really is about counterfeit Christianity. At the end of the, the Sermon on the Mount, there was one part we didn't hit where Jesus talks about people who will come to him at the end of the age. And they'll say, why are we being weeded out? Why, why are we going in this direction when you're going that direction? Look at all the great stuff that we did for you. And Jesus says, I'm going to say to them, friend, I never knew you. So even though this might not be the most relevant physical place for this sermon, there are people that we know who just fade away. They appear to be fine in their faith and their walk, and then all of a sudden they're less fine, and they're just kind of walking away. They're doing something else, and so we need to talk about that. I mean, there are people who are leading small groups, they're enthusiastic about the sermon each week, and then suddenly they're gone. And we think, well, how can that happen to someone who seemed to be on fire for God? Well, these are the parables that help us understand that. And the truth is, they give up. I mean, 1 John 2 says in part that they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. And so what John is saying is that real Christians last. They stay. They persevere. They stay to the end. And if they don't stay to the end, then they weren't real. In John Calvin's teaching, which some people reduce to, to five points, and I'm not going to go through all the points, but they, they have a, um, an anagram that goes with it, which is tulip, and the P at the end stands for perseverance, the perseverance of the saints. Staying to the end is the mark of a follower of Jesus. That's in the first parable. And then in the second, we learn that there are counterfeit Christians who will last to the end. They will persevere, and at that point, God will separate out the wheat from the chaff. So to help us not worry about whether we are a real Christian or not, the Bible gives us some guidelines, some clues, so here's the first couple. A Christian is someone whose heart has been transformed by the Word of God. That's just the baseline. That's who we are. I mean, there is, of course, the soil where the, the seed, and the, of course, in, in the soil and the seeds, the seed stands for the Word of God. It stands for the truth. It stands for Jesus' message that the, the kingdom of God has come near. It's the Word of God. So Peter says, um, uh, first Peter says that we're born again of the word so that what makes someone a Christian is that God's word comes into their heart. And as we know, in that first soil, that doesn't happen. So let me back up and be clear because being a Christian is more than knowing and understanding doctrine, but it isn't less. Doctrine is important. Basically, we must know, we must accept and believe that God is a good father and he is a holy God who demands justice. That Jesus was the son of God who did something on the cross to deal with our sin. We believe the spirit of God comes into a person's heart and regenerates them. And that it's all about faith, not about works. It's not, you can't earn heaven, not ever. And that's the basics. You can't believe less than that and be a Christian. So that's the seed. What's the field? Well, it's the heart. The whole point of what a Christian is really revolves around does God's word, does the seed get into the heart or not? So the set of people who's represented by the soil where the seed doesn't penetrate, just bounces off until a bird steals it away, 
those people are, are atheists. They, they're not listening. They are not interested. It's actually the second and third soils that we really want to talk about, where there is this penetration of the word into their heart, but it doesn't go deep enough. And this is what Jesus is focusing on. See, what makes Christianity inauthentic is in verse 20, that they re receive the word the, the, with great joy, but the soil is rocky. And because of the rocks, the soil doesn't go very deep. And the sta seed stays near the surface and where it's easily knocked out or the sun burns it up. It never really penetrates deeply into the heart. And then the third so soil is similar. It's e um, but these words, worries choke out the seed. See, in that one, in that soil, the seed is closer to getting into the heart, but the problem is there's already other things in the heart, worries about money or whatever. The weed and the thorns have deeper roots into the heart than God's word. And then what you have is a divided heart where the cares of the world are actually stronger and God's word is choked out. But then that last soil, of course, the seed falls on good soil. And, it's, and Jesus said, it's the man who hears the word and understands. That's important. Understanding is important. The difference, really, between those other two souls, soils and the fourth one is understanding. Now, some people may say they understand or even think that they do, but they lack understanding. See, a real Christian is one who has been affected by the Word of God, not just on the surface, but all the way down into the depths of the heart. There's a great translation of Romans 6:17. It says this, But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have, with your whole heart, you have wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted that they obeyed from the heart the teaching that was delivered to them. So the first thing is truth and doctrine, understanding it and accepting it. That's the bare minimum, understanding the kingdom and the gospel. And the second thing is that the message goes to the heart. I mean, you've all seen people who struggle to, to get their, their heart and their mind lined up. You see this often in dating, and, and people who are dating, they're saying, you know, my mind tells me that, that you know, she's really wrong for me. This, it, this isn't going to go well. My friends are telling me this isn't going to go well. I know it's not going to go well, but my heart says, go for it. And so that's, that's where we go. See, the way you see if there's the, the, the message is in your heart is that there's now obedience to the word and a changed life. Paul says in Romans 6 that if the truth gets into your heart, I want you to listen to this, if the truth gets into your heart, it'll affect your mind and your will and your emotions. And I'm going to keep repeating those things because they're really important. The mind, the will, and the emotions, all of those things. So in the first soil, there's no engagement with the mind, the will, or the emotion. In the second soil, there's joy. So there is emotion, but there's no mind, there's no will. I mean, a Christianity of emotions and, and nothing else, that's, that's difficult because we know that emotions are notoriously fickle. And in the third soil, there seems to be some understanding and some action, but there's no obedience. Deep in the heart, the will is still set on the things of the heart, of the world. And the way you can tell whether the gospel has gone into the center of your heart, the center of your being, is that it engages all three, your, your mind and your will and your heart, or rather your emotions. Um, so I'm not interested in talking about the first soil, really. That person's not interested in Christianity. I really want to focus on the second and third sorts of soil because I think there are several sorts of Christianity or doing Christianity that, that look like Christianity, but really there's something less. So I've been helped to see that there's really three kinds. One is intellectual Christianity, one is emotional Christianity, and the other is volitional Christianity. And volition is a, is a word we don't use a whole lot, and it really means people who have a duty. They sense, they do Christianity as a duty. This is what they have always done. So the first thing I want to talk about is intellectual Christianity. They're, these are people who accept the precepts of what Jesus is teaching. You might even call them a nominal Christian, that they agree with a set of precepts, a, a set of doctrines 
but it never takes root in their, in their heart. I, I've been told that, that there are one place where you can find these folks is in the second or third generation of, of a church. Um, and I don't mean older Christians, but people um, who have come along in the second or third generation of the church. So their parents or their grandparents started the church, and they started it with, with great joy and great enthusiasm for Christ and his gospel. And we've got to reach out, and we've got to build the kingdom. What do we have to do to do that? And then by the time their kids and their grandkids come along, the question has been flip-flopped. It isn't how can the gospel get out through me, but rather what can church do for me? How does the church, how is the church meeting my needs? That becomes the new question. And this seems to be people who have been around church for a while, children of, uh, of the ki- people who actually started the church. Their parents had a vital faith, and, and the kids admire it, and, and, but it just doesn't have the same place in their hearts for the, for the gospel. Their, their mindset is, this is my church. Um, this is the way it's always been. This is the way that I want it for my kids, and I don't want it to change. I want it to meet my needs. Here's the thing. The kids of the founders never believed anything else, which is good. They've always believed in the doctrines of the church, good, but they have never come under the power of its truth. And that's an issue. There's another sort of intellectual Christianity that, that is called doctrinal Christianity. And, and these are people who love learning. And sometimes they, get, they love learning so much that you can learn enough and then get caught up in, in the weeds, as it were, caught up in the, in the little bitty trails. These are people who love to think about prophecies, love to figure out prophecies. You know, the, one of the mentors of one of my pastor friends described a person that he thought was in the gravest possible spiritual condition. And, and he'd met some people that would come to him and say, you know what, I've been a Christian for, for 10 years, and it was great at the start, but now I've really kind of settled down, and I've been studying prophecy. And I think I'm becoming an expert at, at understanding prophecy, and I'd like to know your positions on this, this, and how Paul says this. What do you think about these things? And they start to measure other people by what they think about this or that prophecy and even start to tell other people that they're not real Christians because of their position on something in Revelation. I have to tell you, it is, it's one thing to say, I believe Jesus died for my sins. It's wholly another thing to be moved to tears. And, and, and because of the grace and the love that Christ showed you, being nailed to the cross for your sins. I mean, does that humble you? Does it comfort you? Or is it just you, something you believe happened? I mean, we're supposed to be growing in, in love and compassion, being transformed by the gospel of grace. And there are some people who can be very graceless Christians. So that's intellectual Christianity. Another side road is emotional Christianity. Uh, there's two sorts here. And the first sort that I've been, somebody showed me, was kind of this manic depressive Christianity. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I I don't want to put down people who struggle with manic depression. Um, But just that people who are manic depressive, they run hot and cold. They are, when they're manic, they're really high and excited about life. And when they're depressed, they're really, really depressed and down. So these sorts of Christians, they go up and down all the time. And it really is emblematic of someone who relies on their feelings for their assurance in Christ. And feelings, I think, as we all know, come and go. Sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down. This sort of counterfeit Christianity relies on external circumstances to gauge how we're doing with God. If circumstances are are hard and life is difficult, they start to wander away from God because it just isn't working for them right now. Uh, But if life is working out the way that they've planned it and that they're happy, then they're willing to show up on Sundays and go to church. Look at what Jesus says. These people receive the word with joy. They experience an emotional moment, but the word has no root. This is because people mistake an emotional experience for God's deliverance. 
they say something like, yeah, I know God has accepted me because I felt it. I, 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 I sensed it in my being. I, I know it happened. So allow me this. Grace is actually a legal position before God. It's this forgiveness. Grace can come with emotions and it can come without emotions. It's not zapped into us by the sacraments. It's a legal position before God. I mean, I think there's real danger in, in relying on emotion to make us feel like we're good with God. We start to rely on that experience rather than on what Jesus did on the cross. And then there's a second sort of emotionally driven Christians, and, and we call these group manic Christians. This is when a person feels like, only feels like they're a Christian when they're in exciting worship services or great small groups where people are worshiping God and talking about God and, and they're praising God. And in that space and in that moment, they feel like they're close to God. But when they move out of that space, the feeling dissipates and then it vanishes. They don't find prayer by themselves interesting or important. Bible on their own is just not something they do. They constantly long for the another worship time where they can feel that high again, whether that's in church or a small group. I, you know, I walk around here um, on, you know, every day with the dogs, and I met somebody who seemed to be like this, and, and she wanted to know, she found out I was the pastor of this church, and she wanted to know, what sort of music do you have here? I said, well, we have, I don't know, regular music. We have, I guess, folk, rock sort of music. And she said, oh, that's not what I'm looking for. I, I really like gospel music. That's what really gets me going and feeling like, like, like I'm worshiping. I have to say, this is going to sound weird uh, coming from me, but good preaching or good music might actually be a problem for some folks because there's an emotional high that can come with good music or good preaching. Jonathan Edwards, the 17th century preacher revivalist, was so afraid of emotions taking over that when he preached, he just read his sermons and he read them in a monotone and he just focused just like this the whole time and this is how he preached. It was just like that because he wanted to take all the voice inflection out of it. He did not want to give anybody cause for being caught up in, in the emotions. But when people were caught up in the emotions, he could see that God's word had penetrated their hearts because he knew that he had done nothing to encourage that response that God had created an emotional response. Listen, his illustrations were great, his logic was great, his exposition of God's word was excellent, and people were responding to that. See, the problem is that emotional Christianity doesn't like learning and it doesn't like intellectualism. And I'm, being an intellectual Christian is not a bad thing. I mean, I hope you didn't hear me say that. But And being an emotional Christian is not a bad thing either. But if that's what your life centers around, See, emotional Christianity doesn't really like a discussion about biblical doctrine. It doesn't like to reflect on an intellectual level. So here's three signs to recognize emotional Christianity. One, it has little to do with the truth. It, it, it de-emphasizes learning. Two, it exhausts people. You just simply can't keep it up forever. And three, it doesn't really produce a lasting change in people's lives. I'll give you an example. There was a pastor that I learned about who was preaching at a revival, and he could see that it was going well, that the spirit was moving, and there was a guy up at the balcony who, who was trying to figure things out, and you could see the confusion on his face, and you could see that he was really starting to enjoy it, and he was listening hard, and after the, the time, worship time was over, he actually came up to the front to try and meet the pastor, and just because of the way things were, it didn't happen, and he got taken away. And so, but he knew that that guy was out there. And by happenstance, the very next day, he ran into the guy on the street. Um, and, and, the, and the pastor said, oh, it's so good to see you. I saw you there last night. How, you know, how, how's everything going? And the man said, you missed your chance. He said, I was ready to commit last night. I, I would have prayed a prayer with you last night, but now I'm better. And the preacher said, well, let's, let's pray right now. And he said, no, 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 moment's over. You, you missed your chance. And the preacher said to him, friend, I, I don't know what happened to you last night, but if it didn't even last 24 hours, 
It wasn't the work of the Spirit. You didn't miss anything, and I didn't either. And so, there's, so that's emotional Christianity. And I think real Christianity encompasses intellectual, it encompasses emotional, um, but they don't focus on these things. And the last sort is volitional Christianity, the Christianity of just kind of doing your duty, that you've learned to do, this is what Christians do, and so I'm going to do it, and that's it. One mark of them is that they have no interest in truth. They have this basic belief system. Perhaps the Apostles' Creed is, is what they believe and they agree with it, but there's no intellectual interest in it and thinking about it and thinking out about what it means. There's no interest in digging into, into God's Word. There's not a lot of emotion, but these people are faithful. They're dutiful. They're, they're Ten Commandment-centered folks. Um, and there's two kinds here as well. One is a fear-based Christianity, and this is kind of where I was before I really came to faith. And it's this whole idea that God is angry with me unless I do the right things, Um, and and God loves to smite people who step out of line. Um, And unless I do something for God, he's not going to do anything for me. That's the thinking. The fear of failure is greater than a desire to grow in God. And for some people, it is this fear of failure that really prevents them from moving forward and experiencing God's grace and truth and love. And the last sort is is pharisaical Christianity, which is really all about rules. That if you follow the rules, then God loves me and I can get out what I want from life. And I've run into these people before. I I had a friend, I've told this story before, but I had a friend who was dying of, of breast cancer. And she had her, um, her small group come to her and tell her, well, the reason you're dying of cancer is because you have some unconfessed sin in your life. And if you just figure out what that is and confess it, God will heal you. Well, that makes God into a transactional, past, uh, a transactional partner. If I do well, then I get stuff. Um, and if I fail God, then I'm penalized. I mean, this sort of Christian loves to point fingers at at other people, loves to explain that suffering people are suffering because they have something in their lives that's not given over to God, some unconfessed sin. The other thing I've noticed about Pharisaical Christians is that the rules are different for them than it is for someone else. So they, if they tell a white lie, they'll say, oh, it's just a white lie. It didn't really hurt anybody or anything. It's not a big deal. But if you tell a lie, then you are a liar. The same standards don't apply for them as for the people that they're talking to. So that's my my take on these different types of soil and these different types of Christians and counterfeit Christians and, and and what we have to watch out for. I imagine that everybody heads off in some way, um, and I think this week is really for examining what this says and, and, and how God is moving and working in us to think about, okay, how am I getting off kilter here? Am I too far and in, gone into the intellectual and I'm not worried about growing in grace and in love? Uh, am, am, I, um, yeah, I, am I too far into the emotions and that's what's driving me forward and I need to, to hunker down and really depend on God faithfully on, on what the cross has done for me? Or do I really, am, am I doing all the right stuff, but really just because, that I don't really love God, his word hasn't gotten down into my heart, I need to make sure that that's happening rather than me just going through the motions each day. See, this is the thing, we really want God, his word to be in our heart, to be the Bible and his word is the thing that our lives center around. That's who we're trying to be, that we are people and a church shaped by the gospel. And I'd ask you to pray this week that God meets us in Scripture and gives us a desire, a a need to know him better. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, this is a, a bit of a scary parable because we can all find ourselves in here somewhere. Um, I ask, Lord, that, that you would show us how we're getting off kilter and, and how we are not putting you first in everything, but we are getting sidetracked and distracted um, because we don't want to be that. We want to be growing in, in love and grace. We want 
your word to engage our, our hearts, uh, rather our minds, our wills, and our emotions. That we are a people and our people who are shaped by your word. Lord, let that be true of us more and more. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Our response and song is going to be Great is Thy Faithfulness. And um, there's a new chorus in here, but um, I hope that as we think about that message and, and contemplate on where we tend to shift, that we also see that God is unshifting. He's always faithful, and we, we um, keep looking up to, to the Lord.
I hope you have your communion elements ready to go. It is time for communion. Here at the church, we're doing something fun. James and I came up with an idea that instead of grape juice, we're uh, having grapes here. Um, so we figured just a, a grape is an organic grape juice holder. And so I think for the next six, eight months that we'll be, when we serve communion, you'll get a, a baggie that has um, a cut piece of bread in it that's been uh, carefully cut and sanitar you know, sanitarily cut, but also three uh, grapes to participate in. So I'm going to take the use the grape juice, but everybody else here is going to be having their, their grapes. So just know that that's going to be happening when we come back together. So I would remind you that when Jesus, after he and his um, disciples celebrated that Passover, they were in Jerusalem for the Passover, you remember, and then they celebrated the Passover in the empty room, uh, the upper room, and um, after that, after they'd gone through that ritual, Jesus said, I'm going to give you another ritual to replace it with. And he took some of the bread, and he said, this is my body. And, and he broke it, and he said, this, this is my body, which is for you. Take and eat. And in the same manner, he held up a cup, a cup of wine that had been used probably in the Passover celebration, and he said, this this represents my blood, which is poured out, which is shed for you, shed for the forgiveness of many. And as often as you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, you remember my death until I come again. And so we, today, we eat and we drink, we remember, we celebrate that Jesus loved us so much that he went to the cross for us. And I hope that isn't just something you believe but it's something that you know, that you depend on, that, that drives you to, to praise and gratefulness and, and humbles you, comforts you, that Christ died for us. Take and eat. Jesus, we are so grateful for this reminder each month that, that your grace and your love compelled you towards the cross for us, for our forgiveness, so that grace would abound, so that, that God's justice could be met and, and that God's grace could be shown in the same moment that God is holy and God is forgiving and we meet at the cross. And this is the reminder that your body was broken on the cross, that your blood was shed for our forgiveness on the cross. We are so grateful for this reminder. Help us, Lord, to remember this, this week, this month, until we take communion again together, that this is who we are forgiven people. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God's grace is so amazing, and we end with this uh, song that just lifts our hearts up, and, and we sing together. It's a celebratory kind of song, and it's called This is Amazing Grace. breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king of all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king Amen.
amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Brings our chaos back into order. Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of Glory, the King of Glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of His brilliance. The King of Glory. up a benediction as we go. Don't forget, you can meet in Zoom uh, for our virtual uh, coffee hour. So please join us there. I'm, I'm excited about that. So, Lord, send us out from this place full of your grace and your glory, aware more than ever of, of your love for us and so how we are to be loving to others. Send us out here, out of this worship space with your power. Send us out with the heart of Christ. Send us out with the presence of the Spirit. And the people of God say, Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you.